Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever it is you are located. Um, this is our continuation. We are taking a, a little short commercial break from the board boot camp, and we're doing a series um, and you know things to know about the tax season as we're right in the midst of it. Uh, this um, session will be specific to individuals, um, so just important you know facts and things that you might want to know concerning you know individual returns this first one is um it's actually more because we did we, we've done uh nonprofits, we've done businesses just important tax tips on those two uh divisions but this one individuals it's it kind of takes on its own um characteristic if you will the forms that we're talking about when it comes to individuals are not necessarily forms that you have to file as an individual to the um, IRS and to your state. These are forms that other organizations have to file and send to you so that you can put the information on your return and then file your return to the IRS. So what are the more critical forms? So something I'm just going to throw out, out, throw that out at you all that everybody knows about that's a working adult. Um, is the W-2. So W-2 is, a, is an important form. It's a, it's a federal form that you receive um, that you need to put populate your tax return. Other forms, maybe 1099s for some of you all. Some of my contractors out there, you have 1099s uh, that need to be reported on your uh, 1040. You have also 1098 forms. Those are those of my homeowners out there. That form information on there uh, will allow you to take some itemized deductions, so that's important. Uh, you also have various uh, investment uh, financial forms that are just out there, and that they're, they're sent to you. They're supposed to send them to you at the end of every calendar year, uh, but sometimes they don't or they're late. You know, you have to watch that because some of those forms might be more critical than you think. So, so, for example, 1099-INT or 1099-DIV. The 1099-INT is an interest form that is typically sent from you from an investment um, portfolio manager or from a financial institution itself. Uh, you also have um, the 1099-B. Um, the 1099-Bs are uh, you know, brokers forms. They, they, they show the trading history, if you will, of any stocks and bonds you've recently sold or acquired. They show that history and the impact on your, you know, person, you know, financially. So those forms might be more critical than you think because just, for example, take the, the 1099 DIB, so 1099 dividend return or 1099 INT is interest return. You might have accumulated interest enough to put you into a whole another tax bracket. So if you don't report that interest, then you'll be penalized from the IRS for what you didn't pay in taxes on that interest that you earned on that, you know, you know, you know, uh, stocks, bonds, or whatever, or maybe savings account that you had that you did not report the interest that you earned that year. So that's important. So those forms, and sometimes they're small, like you know, you earn $10 in your savings account, um, you earn $25 in dividends, you know, from, you know, whatever. But it's important to make sure that you're identifying all those forms so that you can put everything on your um, tax return that's necessary. So those are the more critical forms. There's, there's heavy duty forms that we, uh, you know, we talk about business, we talk about nonprofits. So for business, if you're a shareholder or a partner, you're going to receive a K-1. For your business and the k1 is vital because the k1 is going to show what percentage of the net income of that organization that you should be reporting now that's big because if you don't report it and you've already been your company has already filed the company's returns and we talked about that in the last um, session where you have your 1065 of your partners you have a, a 1120s of your s corporation you have a C uh, or 1120 if you're a C corporation and, and, and so forth and so on. If they see that these companies filed and you were one of the shareholders or you were one of the partners and this company did really well this year, but your tax return did not reflect that, then again, they're going to 
penalize you and charge you some interest on what you should have paid on that money that you should report. And again, that form that you should receive is necessary for you to populate your um, tax return. So those are the important forms. And there are a few others, but those are like the major ones um, for individual taxpayers. Okay, this next one is, it's, it's a good one for individuals. Um, we have, we have grace. We have like probably the most grace out of, well, no, I wouldn't say that. Nonprofits actually have more than we do because when nonprofits are able to file their tax returns, I want to say the 15th day of the fifth month after their year closes for individuals, um, that's, you know, us, you and I operating as physical people, um, we have to file our taxes um, the, on the 15th day, four months after the calendar year ends. So we don't have that much, but we have better grace than biz businesses typically have to file their returns, you know, three months after uh, the 15th day of the third month after the year ends. So um, we have a, a, a bit more time than they do. But it's important to know that date. This year, I believe, make sure you check now, but I believe it's May, um, April 18th for us this year. Typically, it's April 15th, um, but because of where that 15th falls this year, I believe it's, check now, you gotta check, but I believe it's um, April 18th, but that's an important date, uh, and it's important for you to know why, not necessarily because, oh, I have to have my taxes done by that day, that's not, that's not the reason. That is a good reason if you wanna have your taxes done, because you should, on time, but that date is the also the date where you need to have your extension in, so that you might you, you might not have everything ready by April fifteenth. So you want to extend, you know, a few months so that you can get everything prepared. But know that that extension has to be in by the fifteenth of April. Just like if you plan to file and you don't extend, you need to have all your information in by April fifteenth. Now, why is dates dates are important? So my recommendation is not to wait until April fifteenth to have your taxes, you know, filed and, and, and mailed off or um, e, e filed. My recommendation is to do it before the first quarter ends. Why? Um, most of you, um, or I'll say a significant portion of you all, have other revenue coming in, other revenue streams, be them side jobs, be it. Um, uh, partnerships, um, shareholders and organizations, you have other income coming in that your W-2 wages don't necessarily cover and they don't cover. The W-2 wages, the withholdings from that is specific to the uh, employer and what you're paid by that employer. But this extra money that you're making on the side, you still have to pay taxes on that too. So having your returns done within the first quarter will give you the opportunity to make quarterly payments over the year for all of that other income that you're generating each year. And that way when you file your taxes at the end, the following year, you're not gonna have to owe anybody. You're really actually gonna get something back as a refund. So that's why it's important to know critical dates. Okay, this actually piggybacks on what we just covered um, in the last mini session, if you will, um, as far as what can be extended. So for individuals, um, we can extend when we file, right? So I want to be, I want to make sure you all understand that we can extend when we file. We can't necessarily extend when we pay, right? So that's important to know the difference. Yes, you can extend when you file. And why is that important? So if we can't extend when we pay, why should we care about extending when we file? Well, here's the thing. Um, our, we love them, we love them, we love them, but our federal government has different methods to earn income. And part of the method is penalties and interest. Okay, it is what it is. Um, so the penalties that a our government can charge is on the what you haven't paid and you should have paid, okay? They can also charge you a penalty for not filing this filing on time. Uh, they can they can charge you um, penalties for failing to file. So it's, it's a number of different penalties that they can charge you. So what you're avoiding by extending is the penalty on 
the late filing, right? So that's the penalty that you're avoiding. But there's still other, there's still the, the, the biggest one of them all is the, um, uh, the penalty on, you know, the amount you owe, right? If you owe a large amount, it's gonna be a bigger penalty kind of a thing. So knowing that is important. Now, now, now there, there is, I do need to say this, um, everybody doesn't have a file. Everybody does not have to file a tax return. If you fall into a certain income bracket and you meet other requirements, because it's just not that. So some people say, oh, I make less than this, so I don't have to know it. It has to, you have to meet other characteristics um, or you have to fall into other characteristics in order to say, okay, I fall into the category where I'm exempt from having to file this year. Um, but yes, one of the major requirements is your income has to be of a certain level. But there are other things that apply too, because you can if you're if you don't fit a level, um, or you don't fit all those characteristics, you can't check the box out of all of them. You can make as little as four hundred and still have to file. It just depends on if you're meeting all of the requirements that are necessary to be there, not to have to file. So. Um, that's important as well. So you may actually not have to worry about dates if you fall into a certain um, category of class. And you'll notice like a lot of your retirees, not a lot of them, not, but, but uh, some retirees who just live on Social Security and don't have any investments on the side or things of that nature, they don't need to file. And some of them only filed recently to, to receive the benefit from COVID, that's it. Um, but they can go back to not filing because they meet the requirements. Not everybody, not even them, they have to check to see if they can check all the boxes because you have to, you, all the characteristics have to be met in order to say, okay, I don't have to file. So, yeah. This, this next one is, um, it's a good one and it, it gets into the modality of uh, how, if we owe, what are, what's our process, you know, and, and what do we need to consider? if we have a tax obligation? Well, there's a number of things that you need to consider. Um, first of all, are you paying all that you owe? That's a very important question to ask yourself because you might, or your tax professional might have prepared the return and the system, you calculated a certain obligation based on your AGI and your taxable income but you may owe a little bit more or less than that. You know, you have to look at, and particularly probably a little bit more, um, if you did that same thing the prior year. If you, if you generated that same amount the prior year and you had to pay taxes on it and you generated a little bit more than that this year and you had to pay taxes on this, you might have to pay a little bit more because there's probably penalties and interest on it. I'll tell you where that comes from. It's gonna come from uh, the fact that you knew that you had an overage of five, 10, whatever amount it was that you had to pay taxes on. So the IRS expects you to say, okay, since you know that, you need to make quarterly payments in this following year to address that same thing potentially happening this next tax season. And if, you, if, if that history is there, they very well could, and they probably will, charge interest and penalties on what you didn't pay even though you're making the payment you're paying the obligation they don't care they want the money earlier rather than later when it comes to you should it's almost like you should have known better because you did it last year so you should have known that you were going to generate that same amount over what your tax um, uh, withholdings covers so we expect you to make quarterly payments or estimated payments on that amount um, so that would be a, a, a good one to, to deal with. And the method of payment, jump, just jump into the method of payment. So jump, the method of payment, everybody can jump to that. Um, the method of payment, you can pay by check with the voucher, um, but you also can set up um, for, for your state as well as for your, hopefully for the state of Hawaii, yes, you can do this, but hopefully if you, are in other states and you also have to pay state taxes, I'm pretty sure that there's some methods similar to our state um, when it comes to setting up an online account to pay directly through an ACH wire um, or credit card, or whatever method you have virtually to pay um, from. The IRS also has 
um, a system set up similar to that, you know, where you set up your online account and you go ahead and you make the payment directly. Or, like some of my folks who are, um, who are like old school, I'm old school as well, I like a good old check, you know what I mean, and pen and, you know, smelling the ink and stuff and just put, put an envelope in, you know, um, and I put the voucher in, you know, so you can pay like that. That's very, that's, that's okay. Um, so there's, there's just different methods to pay and you can actually designate your tax professional to just um, set up a account on your tax return where the government will just directly siphon off the money um, from your uh, from your account um, into you know the, uh, the deposit. A lot of folks, and I don't, you know, I'm not saying it's wrong or not. I don't really um, uh, ascribe to that or or, um, or or suggest doing that just because I know um, I'm sure they're not like this anymore. But I know historically how the IRS could be um, in in a freezing accounts and things of that nature. So I know like the, the, the trepidation individuals might feel when it comes to giving the information, unless it's a refund to the IRS like that. So, but, but, the, but the methods, those are the various methods to, to get your payment in. Yep. This last one, understanding options from refunds, uh, it's, it's an interesting one because it's some of these things you all might not know about. So there's various options for refunds, right? So refunds, um, you can, re first of all, how can you receive a refund? Um, so in years past, you know, most of the refunds were, you know, given to the individual via check. Um, recently, maybe, I don't know, I don't know how old it is, maybe a decade, maybe, maybe a decade, you know, um, direct deposits, you know, and maybe a little bit more than a decade, I'm, I'm, I might be wrong about that. But you have direct deposit, you know, they just are as directly deposits in your account. Recently though, They've been giving people these cards where they upload the money on the card and they send the card out to the people, you know. Um, and so there are different methods where you can receive your funds from the IRS. Now the states are different. Depending on your state, usually they just give a check. You know, some do direct deposits. Um, states don't tend to, some are now, but, but states don't tend to be as, uh, I don't want to say speed, but as, um, efficient, if I can say it that way, when it comes to disbursements of funds as the IRS, just because they have like, they don't have any limits, you know, they can print the money, you know what I mean? But, um, but yeah, so those are the different uh, methods that you can receive funds. Now, there are different things you can do with your refund too. You don't really have to get it, you know, again, we, you can get it via check, you know, and, and, and you can get it direct deposited or, you know, you might be one of those individuals who gets the little card um, and the amount uploaded on the card. But you don't have to even get the money. You know, it can be used for other things. So what can it be used for? Um, it can go directly uh, to the next year's taxes. So you can check a box or tell your tax professional to check the box to say, hey, I don't want to, I'm good. We got plenty of money. Just apply it to next year's. I'm good, I'm good with it. We just had the conversation about um, if you owe something last year and you know you're gonna owe it this year, if you have overage, like it's just that, just apply it to next year. And it'll be applied next year, you know? Um, and so you won't get a refund, you won't get anything back, but the following year, make sure your tax professional knows this, and if you change, make sure they understand this, that, hey, I didn't receive my refund last year because I applied it to this year's taxes so that they can apply that amount to that current year's taxes. So that's something that can be done. Um, there's other things um, politically, like campaigns and things, that, that there's portions you know that you can use um, for that. Again, I've never done that. I've never suggested that to any of my clients, so I don't really, uh, couldn't, can't really give you the, the differences in the benefits and, you know, uh, um, the amounts you know that that is possible when it comes to that, but there are those things as well. So there there's a number of things that you can do um, when it comes to uh, your refund. Uh, so again, you can receive it in different modalities, and you can uh, defer it, you know, um, to be used for other purposes. So that's getting into refunds.